Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and marked off the heavens by the span, and calculated the dust of the earth by the measure, and weighed the mountains in a balance, and the hills in a pair of scales? Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord? Or, as his counselor has informed him, with whom did he consult, and who gave him understanding? And who taught him in the path of justice, and taught him knowledge, and informed him of the way of understanding? To whom, then, will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare with him? Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who reduces rulers to nothing, who makes the judges of the earth meaningless. The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Isaiah 40, 12 through 29. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, the Alpha and the Omega, and there is no God besides me. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it and declare it. Yes, let him recount it to me in order from the time that I established the ancient nation, and let them declare to them the things that are coming and the events that are going to take place. The word of our God stands forever. Behold, the Lord God will come with might, with his arm ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. Isaiah 47 through 10. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Revelation 19, 14 through 16. This video is based on the page Essential Christianity. The link is in the description section. I want to talk about Essential, End Times Christianity, and Salvation. So, is End Times Christianity different from normal or traditional Christianity? Yes, because the problem now is that there are so many false teachers and wolves in sheep's clothing as the Bible has prophesied that would happen in the end time. So, new Christians, Christians who have been uh, going to church for a while, I think everyone can get something from this video and the things that I'm going to cover. So it's very important. I hope you enjoy the video. Things that a Christian needs now, more than ever, is a stronger relationship with God. You can't leave your relationship up to the church or the pastor or your friends. You need to really get into the Word and really get into prayer. I suggest every day and really take uh, seriously what the Bible says and start to be more discerning. So a lot of people have a problem with Christianity these days because there are so many different denominations. There are so many different Bible translations, and a lot of people are saying, use this translation, don't use that. And a lot of people are saying, you don't need to abide by the law, we're saved by grace. Or they have different, or you, you don't need to worry about what the Bible says, just go to church. <laughs> there are so many different views out there, so the way we know the truth is by what scripture actually says. And... It helps to have discerning of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to get into all of that. So I would say, yes, there are a lot of denominations, but you know what? That's not even the problem. The problem today is that many denominations are converging back into one end times apostate false religion. The false religion of the end times, the one world religion of the end times that was prophesied to happen. So... That's actually the bigger problem. Denominations converging back into one apostate religion. Now, if they were all converging back into one biblical 
denomination, that would be great. But they're converging into a non-biblical denomination that actually does not adhere to the truth and the beliefs that are coming from scripture that are taught throughout scripture. So too many churches today are not the types of churches that they were just in the, in the um, past 10 to 20 years and before that. So churches now have turned into seeker-friendly churches with um, pastors that are subject to church boards that are more interested or more concerned about donations and contributions, and they have to pay bills. I understand from a worldly point of view what their approach is. They figure they get more people into the church, they can love them into the kingdom. But the problem is, is they're too willing to compromise with the world and with the movements of other churches that they're trying to combine with or seek favor of. Pastors are too concerned with keeping the board happy. Some pastors are concerned with their status, with their standing in the community. And uh, too often, the truth gets left to the side. The full truth gets pushed to the side in favor of the easier biblical messages that they can preach to make people feel good, to keep them coming back. And it's really in the pastor's hands as shepherds to teach the harder messages, to teach goodness and righteousness, to teach all the things that the Bible is teaching. The church boards seem interested in getting pastors who are professionals. They have all the right credentials, they have all the right education, and a lot of them, I'm sorry, they go through their theological school to make a living at being a preacher and a pastor. I don't know that they necessarily were called by God and filled with the Holy Spirit to do what they're doing. And personally, I believe you shouldn't be a pastor unless you were called by God to be a pastor because you're being a shepherd of the sheep, and it's a very serious thing to dedicate your life to. And I don't believe someone should just get into it because they think it's a good career choice. I, I think a person should only choose to be a pastor or a preacher if they were truly called by God. And you know when you're called by God. Personally, when I first was baptized and learning about Christianity in my late teens, I really considered whether I was called to be a pastor or a preacher. And at the time, I was in college, and I really examined myself, and I examined everything, and I knew I wasn't called at that time. I wasn't called to be in a role in church as a pastor or a preacher. I was called to finish the education that I had started and get into the career that I had chosen at the time. So, and I did that, and I was blessed, and I've been blessed. And uh, since then, recently, I have been called. I've been called to do what I'm doing now. So being called, I'm going to be more effective, and I'm not going to do what I'm doing unless it's biblical and unless I'm filled with the Holy Spirit and empowered to do it so that I can teach others the truth and lead them in the truth. So of all the denominations and doctrines and theologies, which is the right one? Well, right here. This is my theology. This is my denomination. And this is my doctrine. And that should be everyone's theology and doctrine, the Holy Bible itself. That should be the denomination. Not traditions of men. Not what's popular for the time. Not what's accommodating. Not what gets the most number of people into the church doors for contributions to make the church grow. It's especially not effective if you're compromising the truth or you're compromising any anything. If your first and foremost priority isn't to lead others in the truth, to teach the truth, to be committed to the truth that's in the Bible, scriptural truth, not your own truth, then uh, you're not serving God at all. That's not going to be pleasing to God. So someone who's motivated by being pleasing to God 
like me, my motivation, if I'm not pleasing to God and I'm not being truthful, then I'm not being effective. I do not accept donations. I do not sell anything. God has already blessed me abundantly in my life following him. I've always given credit to God for all of my accomplishments in life. So I don't want to talk about me so much, but I do want to um, give enough just as a testimony, a testimony to the truth of scripture and having God in your life, how beneficial and how abundant your life can be. But it's not about how abundant our life is on earth. I've been blessed so that I can be a servant in Christ. And I've been blessed so that I'm free from the world so that I can do that. But uh, the real blessing is eternal life with the living God and salvation in him. The real blessing is eternal life, not with what we might get from this world. And in fact, I've never... I've never pursued what I can get from this world. I didn't ever want anything from this world that didn't come from God, which I'm not perfect, and I'm not going to sit here and say I know everything about the Bible, and that's why most of what I say is going to come straight from the Scripture itself. But I am going to say I'm going to give you the honest truth as I understand it, and I don't serve any other man or I don't serve any other denomination, I don't serve any group, and I don't do it for anything but to please God and to be pleasing to God and hopefully bring the lost to Christ and to bring the believers to repentance and renewal in the Spirit. So that's the other part of my testimony is I was walking as a Christian all of my life, but it was only in the past year that I really became an overcoming conqueror in Christ by being renewed in the Spirit. I turned my life completely over to God, every part of my life, and I renounced all sin. I dealt with sin. I renounced all violence and aggression and enmity with others. I forgave everyone else of everything that I could even think of. And He filled me with the Spirit and led me to serve him and, and do what I'm doing now. So I really did feel called, and my life really has changed. I would just hope that people would be renewed in the Spirit and commit their lives to him in that way without waiting so long to do it and without relying on those who are saying, oh, we're just saved by grace through faith. Don't worry about it. Once you accept Jesus as your Savior, there's nothing more to it. He's done everything for you. Well, as far as salvation... We are saved by grace through faith. But that doesn't mean we're filled by the Spirit. That doesn't mean we're filled with the Spirit and empowered in the Spirit to live as a born-again new creation in Christ and to walk as a conqueror in Christ. To do that, you really need to be dealing with sin and forgiving others and walking according to what the Scripture really says to do, to be led by the Spirit not led by the flesh. There is a difference. Okay, one more thing is for those who are not Christians or are not on board with it completely or are not sure if, they're, if they believe in God or not, or you don't have to right away, but go through this video, finish this video, think about it, and what you can do is prayer. ask for God to show you a sign or work in your life and he will. Okay, so here we go. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. This is John 1, 1 through 5. And the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. Glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, John 1.14. So, a couple things to point out here that are very important. In the beginning was the Word, 
and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is saying with no question, Jesus, as the Word, is God. The Word became flesh right there. It's pretty much proof positive that uh, we're talking about the Messiah who became flesh. And uh, that Messiah was Jesus Christ in I'm sorry, from 5 B.C. through 32 A.D. is when he lived and was crucified. Oh, one more, one more little thing here, and it's not so little. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Glory as of the only begotten of the Father. This is John's reference to the transfiguration, which is in some of the other Gospels that um, gives the account of when they beheld his glory when he was transfigured and God spoke from the clouds right at that time and Moses and Elijah appeared with Jesus okay step one recognize sin and repent for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God the sins of the flesh are self-evident which are immorality impurity sensuality idolatry sorcery enmities strife jealousy outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying or coveting, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. And things like these. This is not an exhaustive list, by the way. Like these. Those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Galatians 5, 19-21 now, you never get this part of the verse. The only thing you usually get from pastors and preachers is the next part. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Galatians 5.22-24 yeah, I do have something else to say about this. That until I was renewed in the Spirit and completely gave my life over to Jesus as the Lord of my life and let him have the full reign of my life, I didn't have all of the fruit of the Spirit. I had some components of it, and I could will myself to act in these ways, but there was still the enmity, there was still the strife, there was still the anger, there was still a need for having this exerting self-control of my own will, imposing that upon myself to have self-control. I wasn't so filled with the fruit of the Spirit that it was, it was all that was there. Um, when we start to deal with sin, it purges these um, sins of the flesh out, and we begin to fill ourselves with the Spirit, and then we, we grow in the fruit of the Spirit. And this is the evidence, how we know, of how effective our walk with God is being. And we can gauge this for our own selves, in ourselves, is how much patience do we have with people? Standing in line at the grocery store, driving out on the road. How kind are we? Do we have joy? Do we have peace? And do we have love for others, the kind of love that actually... takes of what we have and gives to others, including our money and our time, and serving others, do we consider others better than ourselves? Do we have that self-control as just an automatic way of being, a way of being as opposed to, yeah, I can control myself when I want to, but yeah, I'm really out of control. No. <laughs> Having self-control means you're in control. You're not out of control. There's no reason to be out of control. So the more that we feel these fruit of the Spirit, the more we know that we're filled with the Holy Spirit. Consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your body so that you obey its lusts. Romans 6, 11-12 For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus is the chief cornerstone the builders rejected. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls will be crushed. 
scattered like dust. Matthew 21, 42 and 44. Okay, now in Romans 6, I wanted to come over here and talk about this since I just talked about that verse from Romans. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. And those who die with him in his death are raised with him in his life. And that's what baptism symbolizes, is dying with him in his death, in his crucifixion, and being raised with him to eternal life in him. Verse 10. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slave, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? Having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. So just because you're set free from sin, that doesn't mean you do not pursue righteousness. In fact, Paul writes, and he's the one who talks about righteousness imputed by Jesus. Having been set free from sin, you become slaves of righteousness. Just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. By being saved by grace, it required the act of Christ dying on the cross for our sins. Without his righteousness imputed to us, we're not good enough. It doesn't matter how lawful we are or how much of the law we obey or how perfectly obey it, we obey it. We're never going, that, that is never going to get us into heaven. It's not enough. We need Christ dying on the cross for us and his shed blood to take away our sins. And then having done that, and having accepted Jesus as the sacrifice for our sins, and as our Savior and the Lord of our life, then our righteousness matters. So I just wanted to kind of tie it into how grace works with righteousness at a high level in understanding without going into all of the different verses that talk about it. We must be born again. And this is what Jesus is talking to Nicodemus about here in uh, John 3. We're born, we're born again to a new creation in Christ. So it's not just accepting Jesus as your Savior. It's being born again. You are a new creation in Christ. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus asked, How can a man be born again when he is old? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, there are two ways of looking at this. One is baptism, being born of water and the Spirit. And baptism symbolizes being born of the water. But uh, that is, when we're born of the flesh, we're born of the water. We're in the womb, we're in water. So... Um, that is another way of interpreting what Jesus says here, born of the water and born of the spirit. That which born is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So here's a very important part of this verse that rarely gets any attention, but it ties back into the Old Testament. And one thing that's great about the Old Testament is the more you learn about it, the more you learn that all these different things that happened with the tabernacle and with the Ark of the Covenant and with the Jews wandering in the desert had everything to do with with Christ, with Jesus, with the Messiah coming and is symbolic in some way of the Messiah and everything that goes on. 
And one of these things is when they were wandering in the desert, they started to sin. And God sent these venomous snakes to bite them. And um, they were dying from it. And, it. and it was because of the sin. And it was a way to, for God to bring them back to being law-abiding and following him and his ways. So Moses intervened and said, what can we do? People are dying from these venomous snakes. And God said, okay, make this staff and put a brass snake on the top of it. And whoever looks upon this will not die from the snake bite. So Moses did that. And that's what Jesus is referring to here. That was a symbol of Jesus being lifted up. And all who looked upon it did not die from being bitten from the snake or having suffered from the consequences of the sin. Jesus says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. John 8. The truth will make you free. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And they answered him, We are Abraham's descendants, and have never been a slave to anyone. How is it you say, You will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, Everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So, if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. So, Anyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. And this is a, an interesting thing that, he, that Jesus says right here. If you commit sin, you're the slave of sin. And he says, the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if you're in Jesus and you're a slave to him, if you're a slave to righteousness, you do remain in the house or in the kingdom forever. Just to summarize, he who commits sin is the slave of sin, and Jesus said that. <laughs> this is in Ephesians 2.8. For by grace you have been saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Usually people teaching salvation quote that part and stop there, and they don't even talk about it. They just let you make assumptions and think what you will. But uh, I'm going to look at this verse a little bit more closely. For by grace you have been saved, through faith. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's usually the part that everyone skips. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. We become a new creation in Christ. For good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, jumping over to James 2.14 here, and this ties in. I'm not just jumping around. I'm making a point. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? Remember, we are saved by grace through faith, and now James is talking about faith. Can faith, faith and faith save him? No, faith and faith does not save you. Does work save you? No, we are saved by grace through faith. <laughs> but faith is proven by works. Show me your faith. Verse 18, show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Verse 19, you believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Verse 20, but do you want to know? O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac, his son, on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? And that's a very important concept to understand and not just gloss over and leave someone to assuming that, oh, well, if I just have enough faith and belief, then I'm saved by grace. If you consider that belief and faith go hand in hand, and the evidence of belief and faith is actually proven by doing something about it, just knowing it 
Knowing it is not believing it. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. But prove yourselves doers of the word, and not merely hearers who delude themselves. James 1, 21 and 22. As James says, even the demons believe and shudder. <laughs> Great verse. Okay. Accept Jesus as your Savior. Now, I don't know if I quote it here, but a very important verse here is, we are, there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. And Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Just in the interest of time, I'll leave it to you to look that up. The great thing about BibleGateway.com is you can search on those verses and find those verses very easily. So for those of us like me who don't have such a great memory, it's a, it's a very helpful way of, if you know the Bible and you can remember part of a verse, you can usually find it with uh, searching through it. And it's also a good way of showing you how much you misremember of the verses you think you know. Many more believe because of his word. We have heard for ourselves and believe that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. John 4, 41. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. John three sixteen. Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give him shall never thirst, but will, it will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. John 4, 14. Truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. When he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. Jesus prayed, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. John 17, 3. To these apostles, he also presented himself alive after his suffering, his crucifixion and death, by many convincing proofs. He said, For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Acts 1, 3, and 5. John answered and said to them all, As for me, I baptize you with water, but one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Luke 3.16 Now this John is John the Baptist. In that verse. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he used to say, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Acts 11 16. And there appeared to them tongues of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts 2 3 and 4. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth my Spirit on all mankind. Acts 2.17 This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you see and hear. Acts 2.32 Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2.38 However, as I, Peter, began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, just as he did upon us in the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Acts 11.15 So, that gets it to baptism of the Holy Spirit. The bottom line is being filled with the Holy Spirit. And but being filled with the Holy Spirit is what empowers you to be led by the Spirit and to act in the interests of God and to serve Him. But God, being rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ and raised up with Him. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. In all things we overwhelmingly conquer, through Christ and His Spirit. Romans 8.37 
Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Count the cost of following Jesus. It isn't wise to commit your life to something or to a cause or to accept Jesus as your Savior without having counted the cost. He calls us to give up everything for him, or to at least to consider him more important than everything else in our lives and to give up those things with, that might interfere in our walk with him and to give up the sin and to give up those things that will lead us astray or make us servants of Satan or at least give Satan a foothold in our life so that we are ineffective in our walk as Christians and possibly fall away. And that's a big problem with the easy grace save Christians today is a very small percentage of them and the preachers who preach those sermons will admit that it's only a small percentage that actually remain as Christians. Well, maybe if they taught more of the truth and the more fullness of it, those who became Christians wouldn't fall away. Count the cost of following Jesus. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. So it's not about being loved by the world or having more abundance or things from the world. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this the world hates you. If they persecuted me, They will persecute you. John 15, 19, 20. Oh, I guess I did quote it here. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. John 14, 6 and 7. Here Jesus states that not only is he the only way to the Father, and it can be inferred to heaven, but also that Jesus is one with the Father. He clearly is saying that he is the Messiah, and he and God are one. His works and his miracles also testify to this as the truth. For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son. John 5.22 Truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. John 5, 24. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 1. Everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. Matthew 10, 32. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. 1 John 4, 15. So go and sin no more. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Luke 10, 27. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. John 14, 15. He who loves the Lord keeps his commandments. Jesus did not abolish the law, but fulfilled it completely. This is how he qualifies as a complete and perfect sacrifice. We are not under the law for salvation but are subject to the law for righteousness. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, or commandments, verse 14, 21. And my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him, John 14, 23. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5, 17 through 19. Flee immorality. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you. For you have been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 through 20. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Matthew 7.21 To those that do not do the will of the Father, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Matthew 7.23 Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he, the Father, from verse 15.1, takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, 
He prunes so that it may bear more fruit. John 15.2 If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. John 15.6 And it teaches some very important concepts here that uh, those who do not bear fruit, he takes away. And if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. So it's possible to accept Jesus as your Savior, and then yet not to abide in him, and lose your salvation and be cast out. Don't let anyone ever tell you otherwise, because the scripture teaches this, and it's right here. Give them John chapter 15, and tell them, explain that to you, and see how good they are at uh, jumping through hoops to explain it some other way, and believe me, many of them do, and they try. That is why it is so important to be discerning. And you will know them by their fruit. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. 1 John 5, 3. Is, is it a fluke? Is it just one or two verse that gets taken out of context here or there that says we are no longer under the law, therefore we don't have to worry about whether we are sinning or whether we are pursuing righteousness or not? No, because we have to look at all of the scripture and there's too many other scriptures that make it very clear. So it's not one or two scriptures that are mistranslated or misunderstood. Okay, this is very important. Basic equipping as a Christian so that you can survive in this world and survive as a Christian. I'm not talking about survive in a worldly sense. Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, roams the earth to and fro like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. 1 Peter 5, 8. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might by being filled with the Holy Spirit. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not struggle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of evil in the heavenly realm. Ephesians 6, 10 through 12. Okay. Therefore, take up the full armor of God. Stand firm, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition, take up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish extinguish all of the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. The sword of the Spirit is the word of God. With all prayer and petition, at all times pray in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Ephesians 6, 13 through 18. I do have a page where I get into spiritual warfare more. That is a whole other topic. Um, and it gets into more how to use these implements of warfare. You have to become a Christian first for that to even matter. So let's cover this. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Philip 4.6, Philippians 4.6 The Spirit also helps in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Romans 8.26 We have a helper. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28. Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. James 3, 7, 8. As to times or epochs, only the Father knows. The day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober, self-controlled. For God has not destined us for wrath. For God has not destined us for wrath. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 9. Let us not sleep as others do. do. The others in the New American Standard Bible has a note that says this is literally the remaining ones. 
Beware of false prophets who will come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Matthew 17, 15, 18. False prophets can be leaders in churches, oftentimes large churches because they tell others what the others want to hear instead of the word of God. Some teach if you have faith, God will heal you and bless you with rich rewards of wealth. This is a false teaching. Jesus performed miracles of healing for his works to bear witness to who he is and who sent him. Jesus teaches, blessed are the poor in spirit, and that it is easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter heaven, and that for everything you give up on earth for him, you will re be rewarded with more in heaven. Christians are no longer of the world or seek things of the world or sins of the flesh, but are of the spirit and seek the fruit of the spirit and to do the will of God. Verse references, Matthew 5, 6, 7, and 19, 16 through 20. Do not worry then, saying, What will we eat? What will we drink? Or what will we wear for clothing? Your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Matthew 6, 31 through 33. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such men as these, always learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. This is 2 Timothy 3, 1-7. And he said to them, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men, neglecting the commandment of God you hold to the tradition of men. Mark 7, 6-8. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 1.7 So the fear of the Lord is fine. You don't just not fear the Lord just because you're now a son of the kingdom and a son of God. You still have the fear of the Lord because it is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn and will confirm that I will keep your righteous ordinances. Proverbs 119.105 For the commandment is a lamp, and the teaching is light, and reproofs for discipline are the way of light. Proverbs 6.23 Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is foolish. Proverbs 12.1 He who despises reproof goes astray. Proverbs 10.17 the sum of thy word is truth, Psalm 119, verse 160. That is an important verse. And other translations say the entirety of thy word is truth. In other words, the summation, the completeness of his word is truth, not just little bits here and there. Even Satan took scripture out of context incorrectly to try to tempt Jesus in the wilderness. Prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. 1 Peter 1, 13-16 Note here that when Peter talks of grace, his next sentence is to be obedient and holy in all your behavior. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, John 14, 15. By this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him, himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. 
Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment, which you have had from the beginning. 1 John 2, 3 through 7. Now little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. 1 John 2, 28 through 29. The one who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he, God, in him. We know by this that he abides in us, by the Spirit whom he has given us. 1 John 3, 24. The Holy Spirit who abides in us, whom God has given to those who obey him. Acts 5.32 Whom God has given to those who obey him. Know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own. 1 Corinthians 6.19 Walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Galatians 5.16 and 21 Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Galatians 5.24-25 However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, but if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Romans 8, 9. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. I covered this in Romans 8. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God, and if we are children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow, fellow heirs with Christ. Romans 8, 15 through 7. Now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Ephesians 5, 8 through 10. The fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work remains, he will receive a reward. 1 Corinthians 3, 13. Rewards for service. I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. Revelation 2.23 Each will receive his own reward according to his own labor, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. 1 Corinthians 3.8-9 The fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through the flames. Or as one escaping through the flames, in some versions. 1 Corinthians 3, 13-15 Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them, otherwise you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. Matthew 6, 1 Watch yourselves that you do not lose what you have accomplished but that you may receive a full reward, 2 John 1-8. through 8. He who sows righteousness gets a true reward, Proverbs 11-18. But love your enemies, and do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, Luke 6-35. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked, for whatever a man sows, this he will also reap, Galatians 6-7. Behold, I am coming quickly, or I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to render to every man according to what he has done. Revelation 22.12 And, very briefly and quickly, to finish up here, Bible study, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Hebrews 4.12 all scripture is inspired by God, or God-breathed, in some translations, and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that those of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. So, try to be brief. I know it wasn't brief, but all very essential.
Now, if somehow God has spoken to you through these scriptures and you are not saved or you're not sure if you're saved, um, you can pray to God right now for salvation. Go to him. Repent of your sins. Turn from them. Commit your life to him. Make him the Lord of your life. You don't need me to pray this prayer for you. You take your time, think about it, and you pray. Go to him in prayer. It's the beginning of your walk with him. You don't need me to pray for you. You don't need anyone else to pray for you. If you're praying for him, for salvation, and for him to be the Lord of your life, he'll hear you. And it's more authentic and more of a decision you made if you're not just going along with me in a prayer. If you pray this on your knees to him, he will know that you're sincere. But be sincere in your heart and begin your walk with the Lord. Begin your walk with the living God in Christ Jesus to be filled with his Holy Spirit and empowered by his Spirit for your walk with him. To be a Christian who can withstand all of the temptations of the world and all of the persecutions that will come, come on you of the world and that are now increasing more and more. But you will be in him, and he will hide you in him through the tribulations and the trials. And he will guide your life and take care of you and keep your spiritual and eternal life his first and foremost priority. So God bless you, and go with Christ in Jesus' name.